Hello, everybody, and welcome to another piece of White Zulu. I hope you're enjoying them. I'm Fee, or White Zulu, and this particular piece is, whoops, chapter 10, Running Free. I was able to run free and loved every minute of my days. Dumi and Co kept an ear out for the sound of the farm bell, which signaled the end of the working day, and packing up our clay oxen and beba corpses or tightly woven reed basket oozing sweet honey, which we'd smoked out of a wild beehive. We made our way back home. They to their cosy looking huts with their smiling mothers stirring uputu with a long stick over a smoky open fire and me back to an anxious scolding Evelina. Still had to hustle me into the bathtub and get me dressed in my pyjamas and into the nursery for whatever insipid spaghetti supper Ben Masango had made for us. As far as mum was concerned, we'd been playing nicely and keeping clean all day, watched over by our nannies, lunch parties and dances. Mum and Dad regularly, at least every month during the summer, held tennis and lunch parties. Sometimes they'd invite neighbouring ranchers over for a few sets on our grass court with drinks on the veranda afterwards, followed by a hearty lunch of roast lamb from one of our merino sheep, accompanied by roast potatoes and vegetables from our garden. Sometimes they would have a weekend for adults only. On these occasions, we were to be neither seen nor heard. I was seven, Nicolette and Diana were at boarding school and Delia was four. And Delia and I would play quietly all morning out of sight, usually out by the stables behind the homestead hearing the occasional pock-pock of tennis balls and shouts and laughter from the players. Evelina would give us our lunch in the nursery behind the kitchen, and when Mum gave Masango the signal to serve lunch in the dining room, we'd race round the lawns that skirted the house to the front veranda to drink the dregs from all the glasses before Evelina, who was helping help wash pots in the kitchen, could catch us. Feeling slightly woozy from the snatched mouthfuls of pink gin, lager, vodka and whiskey and soda, we would trail after her as she took us to her home, a cluster of mud huts on a hill behind the farmhouse beneath the tall, rustling gum trees. There, we'd find a different kind of party. The Zulu women had swept a large area of bare earth in front of their huts with brooms made from twigs tied together. They had dragged logs into a pile in the center and made a huge fire adding gum tree branches to create leaping flames, filling the compound with its unique spicy aromatic blue smoke. All sat around the fire in a wide circle on grass mats and with their palms, two of them would beat drums made from carved hollow logs with animal hide tightened over it. The men sat on their haunches in a group, passing around a calabash filled with amacheo, corn beer. 
we children danced, while the women sang in harmony and kept their hands to the rhythm of the ja drum. Jabu, Tandi, Nobushwe, Dumisana, Makalaza, and I did the traditional Zulu Jiga dance. Arms outstretched in front of us, fists clenched stiffly and knees bent. We kicked our legs high, bringing our bare feet thumping down on the earth. As the afternoon wore on the pace, wore on, the pace would quicken and the drum beats would become more and more frenzied as olive orange frame Flame sprites jumped higher into the dusk, sparks flying as one of the women kicked a log into the centre of the blaze. While Delia dozed in Evelina's lap, I whirled and crouched at a dizzying speed as our dancing became more abandoned. Puffs of red dust flew up as I stamped my small bare feet on the hard, dry ground. I spun in circles around the big fire with my playmates, kicking so high my feet were sometimes above my head as I and my fellow dancers were spurred on by the faster beating drums and hand clapping. Eventually, panting and dusty, I was led quickly back to the house my sleepy sister tied onto Evelina's back in a woolen shawl to be bathed and given supper. Then, scrubbed pink and glowing and in our cotton pyjamas, we'd spend our obligatory hour in the sitting room, sitting quietly while our parents enjoyed their drinks. It was the only social time we spent with our parents at the end of the day with our story books on our laps. Mum would look over at Dad, would look at Dad over her reading glasses, the ice cubes tinkling in her cut glass tumbler. And she'd take a sip of her whiskey and water and say to him crossly, do you hear those blasted drums? They go on and on all night, you know. They drive me mad. Dad rustled his newspaper impatiently and replied curtly, they're off duty and anyway, there's nothing I can do. I kept quiet. Late into the night, I would listen to the drums, letting their quick thump, thump, thump lull me into sleep. Falling asleep to the drumming from our crawl went on for the first 40 years of my life at New Forest. Some evenings my father would pick up his trout rod and calling us and the dogs to hop into the Land Rover, drive up the mountain behind the house. We had to open all the gates, something else to squabble over. It's your turn. I did it the last one. I did the last one. She did the last one. It's your turn. And if you don't hurry up and jump back in, I'm going to tell Dad to drive off without you. And the leopards can eat you. Discussions like this were kept to hissed whispers because if my father heard us, he jammed on his brakes, turned the engine off and roared at us. If you blasted girls don't shut up and stop fighting, I'll chuck you all out here and you can walk home. <clears throat> One memorable summer evening, he took a shotgun with us up to the flays on the moorland at the top of the mountain to shoot some wild duck for the pot. On board was our motley crew of dogs. Spot the pointer to flush them out a young and not too bright mups, a spaniel, which he was attempting to train to retrieve, and Pitts, my dog, who was gun shy and a troublemaker of note. 
After the first few shots, my father discovered that Mups was cowering with pits under the dashboard in the cab. Now I've got two useless bloody dogs. Once taught the other to become gun shy, he complained. You girls will have to retrieve the ducks. Very reluctantly, we took off our shorts and T-shirts while Spot the pointer ran excitedly over the flays, pointing with his tail stiffened at ducks, which my father had shot with unerring aim. And we girls had to flounder through waist-high water. It was too reed-choked to swim in just our brooks, slipping and scrabbling to grab the ducks. We were covered in mosquitoes, bitten on every part of exposed, exposed flesh, and our legs and arms scratched by those razor-edged reed grasses. When we got back to the Land Rover with our ducks, some dead and others wounded, and complaining bitterly, my father just said, Now, wring the le necks of the live ones. With distaste and at arm's length, using just our fingertips, we just twisted their heads round and round on their rubbery necks, only to find them unwinding with speed and the ducks fixing us with a baleful and resentful stare. Eventually, my father lost patience with his feeble, wishy-washy daughters and wrung the ducks' necks himself. This dragged, dragged the two cowering dogs out of the cab by their scruffs and threw them into the back of the vehicle where we were sitting glumly. And when Spot jumped in, Pitts attacked him in a jealous rage and a monumental dogfight broke out in the back. We girls scrambled out using the back wheels for toehold, shrieking with alarm, but not before Mups had sunk his teeth into the back of Nicolette's heel. He was supposed to be her dog, leaving deep punctures which bled profusely. Cursing, my father drove down, drove back down the long, steep and twisting road bouncing crossly over the ruts and bumps with his cargo of cringing dogs, dead ducks which slithered from side to side, and sullen daughters, one of whom was crying and dripping blood everywhere. That's the last time I take you lot out hunting. You're more of a liability than those damn dogs, he said bitterly as we arrived back at the house. Fairyland. The farmhouse was filled with books, and Diane and I had taught ourselves to read very early on. Grandpa and my parents were ardent and omnivorous readers. After the former moved onto the farm, he'd had crates of books sent up from Durban by ox wagon. There were most of the classics, as well as less digestible books. Once I was able to read, I started on the bookshelves which lined the long passage to our bedrooms. All the heaviest books lay on the bottom shelves, and at the age of about four, I dragged out a large tome of Tolstoy's worn piece and hauled it down to my bedroom to devour hungrily. My father's taste in literature was inclined to works factual and fictional on both world wars, particularly about flying, as he'd been a bomber pilot in the South African Air Force. I loved reading autobiographies of men who had served in the British and South African armed forces picturing their bravery as they fired at the Jerrys while they were under fierce attack themselves. 
Although I did wonder why the British servicemen used the words muck and mucking so often. I enjoyed all the works of C.S. Forrester and read the Hornblower series over and over again. P.G. Woodhouse was another favourite as my father had the entire collection. On the top shelves stood the children's books and were the last books we read, having to stand on the big war books to reach to reach them. Various aunts and cousins, most of them, were English and lived overseas. Posted us books on our birthdays and for Christmas. I found them disappointing and childish. The famous five, in our opinion, were simpering poms, and we couldn't relate to their weedy antics with smugglers and gypsies. We jeered at their manners of speech and mocked the way they pulled on coats and boots before going out of doors. But secretly, I envied them all. I envied them their exciting sounding boarding schools and being able to play in the snow with friends. One year, an English aunt had sent us a copy of Cicely Mary Beth Barker's Fairies of the Flowers and Trees, with its exquisite illustrations of elves and fairies. And we were obsessed by fairies from that time onwards. We would draw them in all the fly leaves of our books, the only blank paper we could find, which drove my mother into a rage. She called it scribbling in our books and ruining them. It never occurred to her to buy us blank drawing books or even sheets of plain paper. So we, blew, we drew on any blank pages we found. Although we often received colouring books, colouring in books at Christmas or on our birthdays, we both loved to draw freehand. And Diane showed budding, budding talent as an artist, and she is one today. We'd scamper down the front lawn to the cattle grid spanning a small stream, which flowed from a spring in the pine plantation on the mountainside behind the house and down into the big paddock below the garden. Trees and flowering shrubs had grown up alongside the permanent tr trickle of water, making a pleasant little paradise, which we called fairyland. The best part of it was it wasn't in the garden and thus out of range of our mother's prowling. She didn't like us playing in the garden as we pulled the heads off flowers and turned them into fairies by sticking them onto twigs to play with. And she always chased us out. You've got 5,000 acres to play on, for God's sake. Why do you have to ruin my garden? She'd mutter as we slunk off sullenly. But down there, we could sneak up raid her biggest flowers and bring them back to play, play with undetected. Our private little glade added appeal was its resemblance to pictures of Bluebell Wood in our pookie books, where he and his woodland friends frolicked so happily. Pookie, the little white rabbit with wings, was a set of classic stories for children published from 1945 by Ivy Wallace. We often took our dolls down there as well and played contentedly until we heard Evelina, Evelina calling us for lunch. We spent so much time down there that we had to create goblin land. As we hopped out of bed and left the house as soon as possible every day, we didn't go near the bathroom to wash or brush our teeth, although we always said yes to any questions Evelina asked us about whether we'd done so. 
it never occurred to her to actually check if we were lying. We didn't have time to answer the call of nature either. So if we were caught short, we simply moved a few yards downstream and squatted to Borsha or Tama in a less attractive, rather boggy area overgrown with weeds named Goblinland. There was a big bonga bonga tree, the Zulu word bonga means to thank, growing conveniently down there on the bank. This has nice big strong leaves, shiny on one side and soft, fluffy, and more absorbent on the other, perfect for using as lavatory paper. And they were pleasantly scented in a medicinal sort of way. When we were, all, we were out on an all-day ride on our horses, we always looked out for a bonga bonga tree early on so that we could, pull up, we could pull off a few leaves and stuff them into our pockets for emergency use later. Made fairies out of the flower heads and declared any darker green circles appearing on the Kikuyu lawns to be enchanted fairy rings and stuck our homemade fairies into the soft springy grass around the edge of these circles. We laid out little picnics for them with tiny flat round nasturtium leaves for plates and acorn caps for teacups. We filled these with coloured water which we'd made by crushing petals into an old glass jar we'd found at the rubbish heap and topping it up with water. Delia was fascinated by all this and we allowed her to watch our elaborate and exciting party preparations until, being the youngest, she was hauled off by Evelina protesting loudly to be bathed first. Diana and I described to our entranced little sister all the wonderful tea parties we'd witnessed at sundown after she'd been taken away to be bathed, embellishing our stories with descriptions of a beautiful fairy queen called Rosebud and her handsome escort, a prince dressed in green called the Willow Elf. There was an entourage of del delicate little courtiers, including a pretty little fairy called Bluebell, all of whom got to their dainty feet and danced around our enchanted ring before taking to the evening sky on their transparent gossamer wings and turning into those fragile, shining fireflies which flitted about after dark dark on still warm nights. One evening, Diane, to make our stories even more convincing, decided to write a letter to Delia from the fairy queen. She'd swiped a sheet of our mother's airmail writing paper from the desk in the office and cut it into quarters with pinking shears purloined from the sewing room with finely sharpened different coloured pencils from her colouring box, Diana wrote a letter to Delia. She folded it, it, in, it into a square, drew microscopic hearts and flowers on it, addressed it to dear Delia, and very early the ne next morning, just as the rising sun touched the front lawn, she and I crept out of the house and placed it carefully in the centre of the dew sparkling fairy ring, still festooned with its circle of stick and flower fairies and tea party leaf crockery in the middle. Then we raced down the passage and burst excitedly into Delia's room. Come and look at the fairy ring, we exclaimed, quick! She scrambled out of bed and, still in her pyjamas, 
ran ahead of us out onto the front lawn. She snatched up the letter and looked at it with delight. Is it really for me? We both nodded. Can you read it to me? Although she was getting on for four years old, she hadn't taught herself to read like we had. It turned out that she was struggling with dyslexia, but nobody seemed to notice. There was no such condition then, and my mother thought she was just slow and still only looked at the pictures in books. Dear Delia, read Dine, you're a very good, sweet little girl. We, the fairy folk, will watch over you to keep you safe while you sleep at night. With all my love from Rosebud, the fairy queen. Delia was thrilled and carried the letter around with her all day, asking us, or my mother to read it over and over again. After that, Delia checked every fairy ring she found each morning, and, to oblige, Diane would write the odd letter and leave it there. They were all in the same vein, but I could tell Diana was getting bored with the whole thing, and it wasn't long before Delia did something to annoy her. To this day, I'm not sure what the transgression was, but I suspect Dela took something of Dine's and either broke it or lost it. But I do know that Dine was furious. That night, she penned another letter. Dear Delia, it started, you're a very bad little girl. You've made the fairy queen very cross and she has told me to come over tonight when you are asleep and pinch your toes, signed Fish Grab the Goblin. Delia was devastated and terrified. She was a bit of a scaredy cat about going to sleep at night anyway, and it didn't help that Dinah and I often apple pied her beg bed with prickly branches pulled from an old monkey puzzle tree, which my grandmother had planted near the house. And once we'd carried a large toad in and placed it carefully under her top sheet just before bedtime, at which point it crawled up and piddled on her pillow. She was too petrified to go to bed after the goblin's letter and begged Dine to be able to sleep with her. Bugger off, was the reply. Then she pleaded with me to allow her to spe spend the night in my bed. No, I retorted, sleep in your own bed. And so, after bedtime, while I read by the dim yellow glow coming from a crack in my bedroom door, I could hear her whimpering and sobbing from under her bedclothes yeah. in her room next to mine. Callously, both Dine and I ignored her. Yeah. And from then on, we only had to hiss fish grab at her to get her to run wailing in distress to Evelina. It wasn't o Delia, wasn't only Delia who was the victim of Dine's teasing I didn't trust her either. Once she managed to persuade me to get into the big double horse box, which was parked out at the back next to the stables, and in which my father took polo ponies to those tournaments, not too far away to get to on horseback. <clears throat> Naively, I'd climbed in, only to hear a slam the small groom's door behind me, lock it and run away, cackling triumphantly. I spent the entire morning sitting in there in the dark on a clump of dusty hay until midday, when Evelina had heard my calls for help when she'd come out to ring the lunchtime gong. The pudding. 
However, sometimes I got myself into trouble through my own efforts. All summer long, the big kitchen with its two open sash windows filled up with flies. It never occurred to my parents to put wire, vice, fly screens in. Masangu asked mum to order yellow, sticky, arsenic-covered fly paper from Hoosens, which he hung from the ceiling, and which soon became black with dead flies, but the rest clustered everywhere, on the floor, the work surfaces, and hundreds of them danced in the air. The afternoon in the dead time between two and four, when every person and other living creature on the farm fell into a heat-induced stupor and dozed until an explosive thunderstorm broke the silence and relieved the stifling baked atmosphere. I had got off my bed where I was supposed to be resting, bored, and feeling a little peckish after having listlessly pushed my congealing, greasy mutton stew and boiled potatoes around my plate at dinner time. Now I fancied something to eat. So I crept through the silent house to the deserted kitchen, kitchen, be greeted by swarms of flies buzzing languidly around. I picked up one of the wire swatters which lay in every room and began to lay about me, whacking clumps of flies which had clustered on the worktops until all the remaining survivors were airborne, not wanted to be beaten, not wanting to be beaten by a bunch of flies. I looked around for a better weapon and saw the fly sprayer on a high shelf in the big walkthrough pantry between the kitchen and the back veranda. So I climbed up to grab it. Long before the days of aerosol spray, spray cans, this was nothing more than a little drum into which one poured the spray on the end of a tin cylinder and a thick wire pump handle, which I now pumped vigorously as I chased the flies around the kitchen, knocking them out of the air with the skill and enthusiasm of a fighter pilot attacking those jerry planes, about which I'd recently and avidly read in Dad's war books. Eventually, there was nothing left but a scattering of twitching, buzzing casualties and corpses lying around on the floor. And satisfied with my handiwork, I left the now empty spray can in a prominent place on a scrubbed wooden tabletop next to a large cut glass bowl, which was standing there with a net fly cover over it. Having forgotten my intended snack and pleased at how grateful Masanga would be for having single-handedly eradicated his fly problem, I tiptoed back to my wet bedroom to wait for him or Mackay to hammer on the bell, the rusty old plowshare which hung from a tree branch on a piece of wire, announcing four o'clock and the, sorry, two o'clock, and the signal for the somnolent farm to drag itself back into activity. I was roused from my reading by raised voices, masangus and mums, and I jumped up and skipped happily along the passage to receive my well-deserved accolade. I arrived in the dining room to discover my entire family standing around our irate chef as he ranted in Zulu, waving the cut glass bowl around angrily. Dine dug me in the ribs as I joined them. 
You're in big trouble, she said with glee. That was our pudding you sprayed. And sure enough, the big bowl contained a chocolate mousse, which he'd whipped up using lots of fresh farm cream and sugared cocoa paste, and had left it out to cool before placing it in the fridge for tonight's supper. And all in those days, all the insecticides were DDT based and extremely toxic and I'd succeeded in contaminating the dish so thoroughly it had to be thrown out. I made myself scarce for the rest of the day and pretended not to notice when my sisters ostentatiously pinched their noses at the tinned fruit Evelina put in front of us as we sat at the nursery table at supper time, waiting for our pudding. We want chocolate pudding, they chorused and dissolved into mocking laughter. And with that, I'm going to stop this now and hopefully you've enjoyed it and I've got more of this to come. I want to thank John Muslane very much for being my sound engineer and helping me do these videos. And um, I also want to mention my website. It's www.whitezulubook.com where there are plenty of photographs for you. And I want to thank you for listening. And I do hope you're enjoying these little episodes from my life as a child growing up on this ranch. Goodbye.